Chapter 2 Suffer the Little Children I have been working below three years on my father's account. He takes me down at two in the morning, and I am up at two the next afternoon. I go to bed at six at night to be ready for work the next morning. I have to bear my burden, four traps or ladders, before I get to the main road, which leads to the pit bottom. My task is four or five tubs. Each tub holds four and a half hundred weight, where one hundred weight is one hundred and twelve pounds. I fill five tubs in twenty journeys. I am very glad when my task is wrought, as it sore fatigues. Ellison Jack, eleven-year-old girl, coal bearer, the 1840s. But the young, young children, O oh my brothers, they are weeping bitterly. They are weeping in the playtime of the others, in the country of the free. For, O, oh, say the children, we are weary, and we cannot run or leap. If we cared for any meadows, it were merely to drop in them and sleep. They look up with their pale and sunken faces, and their look is dread to see. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, 1806-1861 to 1861. Cry of the Children, 1842 In the Western world, many children enjoy what we have come to define as a normal childhood. They generally get up in the morning and have a reasonable breakfast, and then, during the majority of the year, attend school. In public and private schools, they are educated in math, science, languages, and other areas of study. While in school, they are fed, and all their basic needs are usually met. They often have a chance to experience art, music, and physical education, and to play games at recess. During the balance of the day, they may interact with their friends, play games, enjoy sports, watch television, play with their pets or engage in an entire host of other leisure activities. At night, they sleep in a relatively safe environment. In the summer months, they often enjoy long, leisurely days playing, and may even take vacations with their family. Although this life is not enjoyed by all, and may not be perfect, it is far more common in the developed world than it used to be. During the 1800s, and into the 1900s, life for many children in the United States and England was that of long and brutal hours of hard labor and poverty. Their lives were not filled with joy and laughter, but often with suffering and crushing misery. From the late 1700s into the 1800s, machines frequently replaced manual labor for the production of most manufactured goods. With the large number of factories, the owners needed sources of cheap labor, which was often found in the form of children. Many machines did not need adult strength to operate, so children could be hired more inexpensively than adults. Factory work for children was abusive and demoralizing. From Edward P. Cheney, 1920 Children from seven years of age upward were engaged by hundreds from London and other large cities and set to work in the cotton-spinning factories of the North. Since there were no other facilities for boarding them, apprentice houses were built for them in the vicinity of the factories, where they were placed under the care of the superintendents or matrons. They were remotely situated, apart from the observation of the community, left to the burdens of unrelieved labor under the harshness of small masters or foremen. Their hours of labor were excessive. When the demands of the trade were active, they were often arranged in two shifts, each shift working twelve hours, one in the day and another in the night, so that it was a common saying in the North that their beds never got cold. One set climbing into bed as the other got out. When there was no night work, the day work was the longer. They were driven at their work and often abused. 
the 1816 report of the Select Committee on the State of Children Employed in Manufacturing detailed the distress that children endured. They labored long hours to the point of exhaustion. Those who lived suffered physical breakdown from the harsh conditions they endured. A photo from 1914. Boy Coal Miners. From Willoughby and de Graffenried, 1890. Children of all ages, down to three and four, were found in the hardest and most painful labor, while babes of six were commonly found in large numbers in many factories. Labor from 12 to 13 and often 16 hours a day was the rule. Children had not a moment free, save to snatch a hasty meal or sleep as best they could. From earliest youth, they worked to a point of extreme exhaustion, without open-air exercise or any enjoyment whatever, but grew up, if they survived at all, weak, bloodless, miserable, and in many cases deformed cripples and victims of almost every disease. Some children began to work at the age of four. An 1843 report by John W. Parker detailed the ages of the children employed to work. That instances occur in which children are taken into the mines to work as early as four years of age, sometimes at five, and between five and six, not unfrequently between six and seven, and often from seven to eight while from eight to nine is the ordinary age at which employment in these mines commences, that a very large portion of the persons employed in carrying on the work of these mines is under 13 years of age, and a still larger portion between 13 and 18, that in several districts female children begin to work in the mines at the same early age as the males. By the mid-1800s, child labor had been recognized as a major problem. In England, a commission was appointed in 1840 to investigate. From Parker, This lad is a pitiable specimen of a much-enduring class of colliery, or underground mine, boys, whose subsistence depends on their own exertions, often prematurely stimulated either from being deprived of their fathers by death or laboring under the curse of drunken, dissolute, and unfeeling parents who would apathetically see their children enslave themselves rather than contribute to their comfort by a single act of self-denial. These neglected beings turn out in the morning, taking with them a scanty bag of provisions to be eaten in the bowels of the earth, where they toil out their daily dole of eight or ten hours, then return to a comfortless home, taking their chance of good meal, a bad one, or none at all. For a bed, they are content with an old coal sack laid upon straw, or occupy whatever portion they can secure of a family bed, which must suffice for three or four other inmates. A public investigation exposed distressing situations termed by some as mine slavery. From Cheney. Children began their life in the coal mines at five, six, or seven years of age. Girls and women worked like boys and men. They were less than half clothed and worked alongside men who were stark naked. There were from 12 to 14 working hours in the 24, and these were often at night. Little girls of six or eight years of age made 10 to 12 trips a day up steep ladders to the surface, carrying half a hundred weight of coal in wooden buckets on their backs at each journey. Young women appeared before the commissioners when summoned from their work, dressed merely in a pair of trousers dripping wet from the water of the mine, and already weary with the labor of the day, scarcely more than begun. 
A common form of labor consisted of drawing on hands and knees over the inequalities of a passageway, not more than two feet or 28 inches high. A car or tub filled with three or four hundred weight of coal, attached by a chain and hooked to a leather band around the waist. An illustration from 1842. Girl and older girl using a creel to move coal. The testimony of a young girl named Ellison Jack illustrated the hardship of her life as a mine worker. She would descend a pit ladder with a basket-like device or creel on her back that allowed the lumps of coal to rest on her back and shoulders. With this device, she could fill four or five tubs of coal during her day's work. Each tub holding roughly 500 pounds meant she moved between 2,000 and 2,500 pounds of coal a day. Since each tub took her four trips, each load she carried was about 125 pounds. An illustration from 1842. Typical passage a coal bearer traversed. From the Universalist Union, 1842. Large lumps of coal are then placed on the neck, and then she commences her journey to the pit bottom, first hanging her lamp to the cloth crossing her forehead. In this girl's case, she has first to travel 14 fathoms, 84 feet, from the wall face to the first ladder. This ladder is 18 feet high. From this ladder, she proceeds along the main road, that is probably from 3 feet 6 inches to 4 feet 6 inches high, and so on to the second ladder, which is 18 feet high, and so to the third and fourth ladders, until she reaches the pit bottom, where she casts her load. Injuries and disease were commonplace. Many children died of diseases such as typhus, and women also had stillbirths due to the stressful conditions. An illustration from 1842. Child Pulling Corf Other mine jobs, although not as labor-intensive, were also dull and dreary. One job for boys was to wait all day long to open and close the gates for the wooden sleds or corfs, which were used for hauling coal. From the Universalist Union The trappers sit in a little hole scooped out for them in the side of the gates behind each door, where they sit with a string in their hands attached to the door and pull it open the moment they hear the corves at hand. And the moment it passes, they let the door fall to, which it does of its own weight. They have nothing else to do, but as their office must be performed from the passing of the first to the passing of the last corf during the day. They are in the pit during the whole time it is worked, frequently above twelve hours a day. It is a most painful thing to contemplate the dull, dungeon-like life these little creatures are doomed to spend, a life, for the most part, spent in solitude, damp, and darkness. They are allowed no light, but sometimes a good-natured collier will bestow a bit of candle upon them as a treat. In the early 1900s, children were still being employed by the mining industry. Even though children younger than 14 were officially prohibited from working, some as young as 9 or 10 could be found employed in the mines. Due to improved machinery, boys were principally employed as coal breakers, picking out slate from coal as it was dumped into the mine cars. In the breakers where coal was dried, the coal dust was so dense that, even on bright days, light would not penetrate. Breaker boys needed to wear mine lamps on their caps to allow them to see the coal at their feet. Although safety precautions were taken, children sometimes suffered horrific deaths. A photo from 1914. The Lonely Trapper Boy From Owen R. Lovejoy, 1906 
It is true we occasionally hear of a little boy in the mine run over by a coal car, or kicked to death by a mule, or fatally injured by a piece of falling slate. And in the coal breakers, little boys are sometimes ground into large crushers that break the coal, caught in the wheels or other machinery, or buried in a stream of coal. The death suffered recently by the little boy in Pittston, Pennsylvania. In the 1800s, children employed in glass manufacturing worked long hours in extremely challenging conditions. They suffered from a wide variety of physical problems. From Roy Porter, 1997. In the manufacture of glass, the hard labor, the irregularity of the hours, the frequent night work, and especially the great heat of the working place, 100 to 190 Fahrenheit, engender in children general debility and disease, stunted growth, and especially affections of the eye, bowel complaints, and rheumatic and bronchial affections. Many of the children are pale, have red eyes, often blind for weeks at a time, suffer from violent nausea, vomiting, coughs, colds, and rheumatism. The glass blowers usually die young of debility or chest infections. A 1906 article by Owen R. Lovejoy spoke about child labor in the manufacturing of glass. Boys worked near the blistering heat of the furnace and performed many jobs. Because glass manufacturing could continuously operate, boys were also employed to work at night. After laboring long hours in excessive heat, they were sent home early in the morning. A photo from 1914. Boys in the manufacturing of medicine bottles. From Lovejoy. It is significant that in many glass houses, one hardly finds the child of a glass blower. One worker who spent his life in the glass house when asked the reason replied, I would rather send my boys straight to hell than send them by way of the glass house. A young friend whose character and family are well known said recently that of the 175 boys with whom he worked, in an Indiana factory two years ago. There were only ten at the end of the fire who were not confirmed drinkers of intoxicants. In the early 1900s, in the state of New York, children worked in the cannery industry for endless hours. The housing supplied for these seasonal workers was inadequate and unsanitary. As many as eight people were found living in a small room, the outhouses were unspeakably filthy. There were no screens covering the openings of the windows, permitting swarms of flies to travel from the filth of the outhouses to the small rooms that contained exposed food. The canners blamed God for the terrible plight of the children and women. From the Child Labor Bulletin, 1913. It's the Lord's fault. We cannot control the ripening of the crops that canners gave in 1912, as in previous years, as their excuse for beginning the work of 12-year-old boys at 3 a.m., for working 10-year-old girls 14 and a half hours a day, for working women as many as 100 hours a week. A photo from 1913. Children snipping beans in Maryland. Eight-year-old girls capped cans. They placed a small tin disc that was soldered to the cover of the filled cans of fruits and vegetables, capping 40 cans a minute. A child was hard-pressed to keep up with that rate. A photo from 1913. At a dangerous capping machine. In other industries, the difficult and dirty working conditions, long hours, and exposure to toxins such as lead created a variety of physical disabilities in many. From Cheney, women and children in lace making were often kept at work during the busy season till 9, 10, or even 12 o'clock at night. That the girls in dye houses 
who carried wet goods on their backs into drying rooms at as high a temperature as 110, and then out onto the grass fields, were often summoned to work at four or five in the morning. That there were more than 2,000 children under 10 years of age at work in the Birmingham hardware industry, one-fourth of them under eight. And that weak sight, blindness, and lead poisoning were prevalent in the potteries and other industries, which were carried on under shockingly unsanitary conditions. An 1890 book on child labor describes the manufacture of paper boxes. Like other factory work, it involved long, endless hours of mind-numbing work. From Willoughby. The ceilings were low and begrimed, the light not unfrequently inadequate. Each worker is then provided with an oil lamp, whose smoke and fumes combine with the odors of the glue pot and neglected water closets to make the close room more hurtful. Piles of inflammable paper and stacks of boxes await but a spark to kindle a fire that would sweep the building before the dazed inmates could rush to the dark and dangerous stairs, only to find the way barred by packing cases. In such death traps, thousands of children labor. The lame and humpbacked choose box-making as light work permitting them to sit. Their distorted figures and pain-marked features stand out sadly in the dim light behind long tables, piled grotesquely with box shapes. A photo from 1914. A child employed as a doffer. A 1913 article in Good Housekeeping details the labor of children in the cotton mills. A majority of the workers in the cotton mills are under 16, and that the ages of them run down to 6 and 7. The girls are used as spinners, and for the most part, walking up and down between the spinning frames and knotting threads that break. And the boys are employed as doffers, for the replacement of the empty bobbins with full ones. The hours that these children work is well nigh incredible. Either they toil from six in the morning until six at night, or from six at night until six in the morning. It is also the truth that the day shift is frequently asked to work two or three nights a week, so that there are days when the child works for 17 hours at a stretch. A photo from 1913. Children, six, eight, and two of twelve years, making hose supporters by lamplight. Children could also be employed at home, doing tedious work in what was known as tenement industries. This work involved the production of clothing or other products that factories hired out to be done at home. A 1913 Massachusetts Child Labor Committee report describes the difficult working conditions and the effects on children. Work is done in close, poorly ventilated rooms, often in dirty kitchens and in unhygienic houses. The children work long hours and often late at night by lamplight. Small children of five, seven, and nine years of age work in a bending position until nine or ten o'clock. This is bad for the eyes, causes nervous strain, interferes with the child's schooling. The anemic, tired, nervous, overworked children are driven until they cry out against the abuse. A girl seven years old had worked sitting in the hot sun while she was sick with measles. The lack of care at that time was followed by her death. The breakdown of healthy family systems and the resultant infant neglect was a large contributor to disease in the past 200 years. Women and girls were often forced to work in order to survive. According to the 1901 English census, of the 13 million females older than 10, 4 million were working. The difficult working conditions often resulted in physical breakdown, leaving a population of children who were frequently neglected. From Sir George Newman, 1906. Mothers employed in factories are, save during the dinner hours, 
absent from home all day long, and the care of their infants during their absence is entrusted to young children, hired nurse girls, sometimes not more than eight or ten years of age. Lack of knowledge regarding proper child care, combined with poverty, stressful working conditions, meager nutrition, improper hygiene, and poor sanitation, led to a large number of child deaths. From Newman Few facts receive more unanimous support from those in intimate touch with this question than the ignorance and carelessness of mothers in respect of infant management. Such ignorance shows itself not only in bad methods of artificial feeding, but in the exposure of the child to all sorts of injurious influences, and to uncleanly management and negligence. Death in infancy is probably more due to such ignorances and negligence than to almost any other cause, as becomes evident with we remember that epidemic diarrhea, convulsions, debility, and atrophy, which are the most common causes of death, are brought about in large measure owing to improper feeding or ill-timed weaning. Bronchitis and pneumonia are due not infrequently to careless exposure, and death from measles and whooping cough is largely caused by mismanagement of nursing. A photo from 1914. Massachusetts Mill Workers Due to the extreme working conditions, long hours, revolting environments, little rest, poor nutrition, the resulting health of children was deplorable. Their weakened constitutions left them extremely susceptible to diseases of all types. From Parker The medical witnesses state that the general health is greatly deteriorated, that the children are pale, thin, delicate, feeble, stunted in growth, more than usually susceptible to certain formidable diseases, and much less able than common to resist the ordinary causes of disease. The prevailing complaints are general weakness, often amounting to fainting, pains in the head, side, back, and loins, palpitations, sickness, vomiting, and loss of appetite, curvature of the spine, scrofula, and consumption. The female health, in particular, appears to be constantly and grievously disturbed. From Cheney, children who began work so early in life were subjected to such long hours of labor, did not grow so rapidly, nor reach their full stature, nor retain their vigor so late in life, as did the population outside of the factories. A photo from 1913. Child Factory Workers From the Child Labor Bulletin In regard to health, also, there is no occupation which a child can pursue all day and every day without injury. As a matter of fact, there are a considerable percentage of accidents in the mills and a high death rate from tuberculosis. But, we repeat, these incidental dangers might all be done away with without affecting the fact that the mental strain involved in the noise of the mill and the sheer muscular strain of any simple motion repeated past the point of fatigue do seriously weaken the growing child. Even where there is no immediate traceable injury, there is always an indirect effect whereby the child is made more susceptible to infection. Children in industries were also exposed to a number of poisonous materials that impacted their health and immune systems. From the American Journal of Nursing, 1903. Crouching down, out of sight behind bales of paper where arsenic is used, exposed to the poison of lead, mercury, phosphorus, copper, and other toxic influences, and the ills of artificial humidity essential to the spinning of cotton, flax, wool, and silk. The difficulty is to catch them at it, to discover them really at work, and then to prove that they are under the age required by law, for, as these little people say themselves, it is easy to fix the Board of Health certificate if you only know how. 
lead poisoning, or flumbism, causes loosening and dropping out of teeth, frightful colic, blindness, paralysis, and sometimes death in convulsions. Phosphorus ulcerates the gums, causes decay of bone, terrible disfigurements, blindness, and paralysis of the wrists, and often death. Mercury gives rise to anemia, or bloodlessness, to spongy gums, loosened teeth, and paresis, or impaired movement, of the limbs. Nitric acid, used for cleaning, may cause instant death. The germs of lockjaw reside in hides, wool, and fur. A photo from 1919. Only a box for a house and a railroad yard for a playground. Into the early 1900s, many children of the working poor lived in crowded tenements with no yards. When they had free time, their playgrounds were the city streets, or worse. A 1920 article in Good Housekeeping stated that 250,000 children died each year in the United States due to poverty. There is no escape from the conclusion that the United States, the richest nation in the world, is allowing every year a quarter of a million of her own children to be killed by poverty. All other causes come back in the last analysis to that one. The world we enjoy today is built in part on the ceaseless labors of children of the past. The conditions they worked and lived in were just as horrifying as they were for the adults at the time. Extreme working conditions, poor nutrition, and lack of sanitation and hygiene left many children in a terrible state of health. Unfortunately, many children elsewhere in the world today are subject to similar working conditions and poverty. Thank you for watching. References and links are down below. If you thought this information was valuable, please like and share. If you agree or disagree with anything, please respectfully comment. We all learn when we share and consider other people's views. Please visit dissolvingillusions.com for free charts, photos, book chapters, book audio, and more. Please visit movingbackfrommidnight.com, which contains information on my new book on the major environmental issues we face as a planet, including free book chapters, photos, and more. In this time of increasing censorship and attacks on free speech, please watch my videos on odyssey.com. Thank you, and have a stellar day.